All right. Let's say a prayer before we start our study this morning. Lord, we thank you for giving us the privilege to serve you, and I pray that we would remember who we are throughout the week. Uh, not just fathers and workers and brothers and sisters, but your ambassadors. And we are given the, com the task to communicate uh, your truth, your gospel to people who don't know it. Uh, although there are people all around us who claim to be Christians, help us to have the courage to speak with them about what they say they believe so that we can correct the errors, that we can right the wrongs, and that we could all come to a greater understanding of your word and actually get some things done in this world. So we thank you for the opportunity to do that this morning and equip each other as we study your word. Amen. Okay. Now to the question of the morning, which is what happened to Peter? Uh, the topic this morning is trying to answer a question I get quite often. Some of you have asked it before, and other people ask the same question, so you're in the same boat. Um, there's not too many new questions people ask, and so if you have a question, probably other people have the same question, um, going back to why you should ask your questions uh, here at church. But uh, this question's a common one. What happened to Peter's ministry? It's only a question that people ask when they start to learn the Bible rightly divided. They start to learn that Peter and Paul taught different messages and that there was different ministries from the Lord given to them. The inevitable question is, well, what happened then to the little flock? What happened to Peter's group? And so we're going to try to deal with that this morning. Okay. Now, most often, uh, maybe not most often, but a lot of the times people ask this question out of skepticism. And at the outset here, I need to encourage you not to be discouraged about the very simple and basic things you know that are clear from God's Word. As you're studying God's Word rightly divided and learning what it means that to preach Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery, you need to be stable in the basic things first. And the most basic I can present to you about the Bible rightly divided is that Paul had a message that was kept secret since the world began, and Peter in Acts 3.21 taught a message that was prophesied since the world began. Whatever the messages are, those must be different. And so then you go to step two, and what is the message, and how are they different? But that's the, that's the first point, okay, of the beginning of mid-Acts right division, is that Paul was given something that nobody else before him knew. And when you're on that trail and figuring out what that is, and you start to flesh that out, and that it's the preaching of the cross, and it's the mystery of Christ, and the church, the one body, you start to see that all of our instructions for the church are found in Paul's epistles. And the clearest gospel in the Bible is found in Paul's epistles. And that's significant. That's important. And, and so we, we, we take that pattern. But a lot of times people ask this question in order to discredit even the simple things that we just stated there. And they say, well, mid -X can't be true because what happened to the little flock? Or what about 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6? Well, the response is always, look, you know, there's questions that we need to study. There's questions that we need to answer. But that does not mean that Paul didn't have something different than Peter. Okay, and so we need to, again, understand the basic questions from questions that we may all have. Uh, Brother Stam and mid act dispensationalists of the past, who maybe did not call themselves mid act dispensationalists, as an example, I, I may present uh, Robert Anderson, who a hundred years ago wrote books, who you read his books, and it sounds like he's saying the same thing I'm saying today. In Paul's epistles alone, you find the doctrine. We know that we find instructions for the church in Paul's epistles. He wrote a book on healing and was talking about healing and miracles and how you can't use Mark 16 as evidence of healing today because we all know that Paul has the doctrine for the church. And he wrote this 100 years ago. He didn't call himself a mid-act dispensationalist, but he acted like he was doctrinally, you see, because he knew that Mark 16 was irrelevant to the conversation because that was before the mystery was revealed to Paul. Okay, so in the same way, when people ask the question, what happened to the little flock, what happened to Peter's ministry, what happened after the book of Acts, you know, well, this does nothing to dispute or negate what we already know about the mystery revealed to Paul that Peter didn't know in Acts 3.21, okay? And so at the outset, make sure you understand that, that this is a question we're trying to answer from the perspective of an sensationalism. Brother Stam, uh, other his, those in the, fa uh, in the past, Robert Anderson, for example, didn't even address this question. They thought Hebrews through Revelation, James, 1 John, 1st, 2nd Peter, were written about the church. They thought, well, this is, these are all letters we can use today. And they were mid act dispensationalists. Brother Stam was an ardent Pauline dispensationalist. And yet he thought Hebrews was written by Paul, and he thought the 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John had instructions for the church. But he was an ardent Pauline dispensationalist. So I don't agree with him, and we'll see why this morning, but uh, just making that point, making it out there, okay? Meanwhile, what we need to start with is what is the difference when we're trying to figure out what happened to Peter's ministry. 
Some people ask the question, what happened to Peter? And they have these assumptions that perhaps Peter just stopped doing things altogether. Did he just quit? Well, that's not exactly right. Did he join up with Paul? So that now Peter said, oh, Paul, you got this message, so now I'm going to teach the same thing. And did Peter and Paul teach the same thing after that? Right. What happened to Peter's little flock? Did they become part of the body of Christ? These are questions people have. Right? Did they start preaching the mystery and it were part of the heavenly purpose? And if so, what about the earthly promises? And so they have these questions. And so I know this question is, is, is a little more advanced, but we need to start at the basic things and what Acts talks about and how the, the messages are different. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 2. Peter and Paul had different messages they were preaching. By that, I do not mean that God has different ways to save people. You can be saved by your works if you want to. You can be saved by grace if you want to. That's not true at all. The only way that God could ever save any humanity is by his grace given to humanity. Okay? Now, not at all times in the Bible did people understand his grace, nor did God reveal his grace. That's why the dispensation of grace is so important to know when God revealed that hidden information. And so in Luke 9, the dispensation of grace had not been given yet. What had been revealed from God is what was spoken since the world began, that God would bless Abraham and those who are a part of his covenant, and they would be the channel of blessing to the world. He promised them a kingdom through which righteousness would reign on the earth, peace would reign on the earth, and salvation would come to all on the earth through this kingdom. And so in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when John the Baptist comes and says, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. That was his message. That was his gospel of the kingdom. He's preaching a message of fulfillment of prophecy and inevitably salvation coming to the world through Israel. Right? That's what he's preaching. Luke chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus chose 12 men to be his disciples, his apostles that he sends out, and gives them authority over all devils to cure diseases, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Notice here what the message is Jesus is telling them to preach, what the gospel is. The gospel is simply the message, okay? what, what God offers humanity, what God is trying to communicate. And what they're doing is healing people and preaching the coming of the kingdom God had promised, the earthly kingdom. Okay, down in verse, uh, oh, down in verse 6, I believe, where it says they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So there, there's that word gospel there that defines for you the gospel of the kingdom. Mark 1, 14, Jesus preaches the gospel of the kingdom when he says the kingdom is at hand. That's the definition of what the gospel of the kingdom is. Luke 18, 33, and I know these verses should be old hat to most of you. If they're not, mark them because they need to be. This is how you show someone from their Bible that there's different Gospels in the Bible, which will lead them to the conclusion that they need to be following the instructions Christ gave to Paul. But in Luke 18, notice these disciples preaching the message, the Gospel of the Kingdom, were not preaching the cross of Christ. Because, number one, the cross hasn't happened yet. Number two, in Luke 18, 31, when Jesus began to tell his disciples what would happen when he went to Jerusalem, they did not understand it. He says in verse 31, as we go to Jerusalem, all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He shall be delivered, and the Gentiles mocked, spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death. The third day he shall rise again. Verse 34 is the key verse, that they understood not these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. They preached the gospel nine chapters earlier. They don't know the gospel you trust for your salvation. They don't know the gospel of the cross. Okay, the gospel of the kingdom is not the preaching of the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15 that the gospel I preached unto you is that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He rose again according to the scriptures. So you know this fundamental gospel difference. Look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 9. There's another message that Peter was preaching that was part of this kingdom message that had to do with the circumcision. I already mentioned to you that God's purpose uh, up to this time, up to Acts, was to bring this kingdom and to bless his people Israel, and thus bless the world through them. God's people were identified through their covenants, okay? And the earliest covenant given to them was the covenant of circumcision. And so this made a separation, physically and spiritually, between God's people and the other nations. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, we see when Paul was in his ministry, uh, he went to Peter because there was some contention, some differences, to resolve the differences. We'll get to that in a moment. But notice here there are two Gospels in this verse. Galatians 2, verse 9. 
And it says when, or, or verse 7 rather, Contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. They, it says in verse 9, when they saw uh, that grace was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. That we should go to the heathen, and that, and that they would go to the circumcision. Okay, but the point is, there's two gospels. There's a gospel Peter's preaching to the circumcision. So his message of salvation through a kingdom that got a promise to Israel was through circumcised people. So he went to circumcision, preaching to them that God's going to bless you now through this man, Jesus Christ, so that you would be a nation above the nations and we can go to teach all nations. Right? <clears throat> Paul says, the message I was given to preach was to uncircumcised people. Now that's very different. Okay, I say very different in the sense that if you're going to bless the world through Israel, you have to start with circumcision. You have to start with Israel. If Paul goes to uncircumcision, then suddenly, what is he preaching? He's not preaching a blessing through Israel if he's preaching a blessing without Israel. You see? Those are different messages. And so again, here we have a, a good contrast of the different messages Peter and Paul preached. This is the foundation of Pauline dispensational right division. Okay, it's understanding these differences. And if Paul's ministry then, if our gospel is a gospel to all men, circumcision, uncircumcision doesn't matter, and if our message is not through an earthly kingdom, but rather through the preaching of the cross of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, then what happened to Peter? That's the question. <clears throat> what happened to Peter's little flock? I mean, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, there was thousands of them at Pentecost and after. And Peter, through the book of Acts, we read about him. And what happened? There's a whole church that thinks he's their first pope, Roman Catholics, right? So what happened to this guy? <clears throat> Other churches try to follow the, the pattern of the 12 apostles, not the one apostle Paul to the Gentiles. So what happened to Peter's ministry? Okay. <clears throat> well, first we need to understand a few things. Uh, number one is that as I just explained to you, Peter and Paul teaching different gospels. Now I'm going to flip the coin over and say, though they preach different gospels, there are some things they taught the same. Okay? They were not enemies of each other. Paul didn't try to subvert Peter. Peter didn't try to subvert Paul. Okay? Paul never went to Peter and said, you know what, Christ sent me to preach a kingdom. He didn't say that. Peter was sent to preach a kingdom in the prophetic fulfillment. Neither did Peter go to Paul and say, hey, I'm going to preach the mystery with you. That never happened. Never. Peter and Paul always taught what Christ sent each one of them to, to preach. Okay? And so again, raises the question, what happened to them? But first we need to understand the relationship between Peter and Paul. Paul did not go over to Peter's church and try to steal members from it. And Peter didn't try to do that to Paul's church. Neither should we do that with other churches. Okay, that's not what, what, what the deal is. It's always about evangelizing people to faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the gospel. Okay, this is what we ought to be doing. It's much easier to preach the Bible rightly divided to people and the truth to people who are looking for it, who need it. Not to people who are in another church, who are already there and are happy there, and you're trying to get them to come out, you know, to come out of that church. No, that is subversive, and that is dishonest, and it lacks integrity. That's not the way you do it, okay? You go to people who need to hear it. If people are in churches, and the churches are teaching wrong, then we need to identify the churches teaching wrong. But we're not to disrupt what they do, okay? We don't go to people's houses, knock on the doors, walk in and say, you need to do this and that better. It's their house, okay? It's their church, you see? If you don't like the way they're doing it, leave. Start another one. That's what we did. Okay? We're trying to do things that are right. But Peter and Paul, they, they taught some same things. For example, number one, they both taught Jesus Christ. You say, yeah, duh. Well, that's important because in the first century, nobody else did. There was not the, the first church of the Baptists down there and the Presbyterians and the Methodists. There was no one preaching Jesus Christ except for Peter's group. When Paul was saved in the road of Damascus, he was saved on the road to Damascus to faith in Jesus Christ. He, he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah before. Now he knew that he was the Lord of all. Right? That's what Peter taught. You see? Peter knew he was the Lord of all. Peter knew that he was the Son of God. And he had known it longer than Paul. They both taught Jesus Christ. And so as they're going uh, in ministry, whether it be Peter or Paul, one of the things they teach, as we discussed this morning, was the fundamental of Christianity that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. This is necessary to communicate. And so they both believe Jesus is the Christ. They both believe Jesus was the Son of God. They both believe Jesus was the King of God's prophesied kingdom. Now, I'm not saying that Paul went around preaching the kingdom come, but I'm, you believe Christ is the King of the prophesied kingdom, <clears throat> right? He is the promised King. He is the King of kings. 
So there are things that they knew about Jesus Christ. As Paul went to synagogues all throughout the book of Acts, the first thing he would do is try to convince these unbelieving Jews that Jesus was the Christ they were looking for. From the scriptures, he is the Messiah. You can't get to the fact that he died for your sins until you get to the fact that he is the Christ. And so that's the thing they agree on. You see, that's why what Paul was trying to go to Peter and try to, hey, you know, I'm a believer in Christ, in the Christ now. They had this in common. Another thing they had in common was believing Christ's death and his resurrection. See, are you saying they taught the same message of salvation? Well, there are things that Peter did not understand about the cross of Christ. We saw in Luke 18, when Peter was preaching the kingdom and healing everywhere, he did not understand why Christ had to die. He, did, he tried to prevent it in Matthew 16. Right? So we understand that Peter at one point did not understand it. But then when Christ resurrected and he taught in his resurrected body to the 12 apostles for 40 days about the kingdom, I think they get the idea that he's not dead anymore. Right? <laughs> they knew that he was resurrected eventually after death and resurrection. And so what Paul and Peter had in common, again, is that Jesus was the Christ and that he died and that he rose from the dead. Right? If Peter, anyone in Peter's group denied Jesus rose from the dead, they would, be, they would be heretics. They would be the ones who got it wrong, you see. Christ rose from the dead. Peter says, I saw him. The 12 apostles said, we saw him. They were told to be witnesses of his resurrection. Paul would not even be saved if it were not for the resurrection of Christ because he didn't even believe Jesus was the Christ before he died. It was only after he died that Peter, after his slaughter of, the, of Peter's group, that Paul saw Christ resurrected. How do you explain that? I mean, Peter's group could have lied about it because they knew him before and then lied that they, he resurrected and then pretended. How does Paul pretend? He didn't believe Christ even after he resurrected until he saw him on the road to Damascus. Paul's whole message in apostleship is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's a proof of it. My point here is that Peter and Paul both taught this information. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 11, where Paul says, whether it be they or I, we both preach Christ rose from the dead, and people read that and say, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 11, did Peter and Paul teach the same gospel, the same message? min is, must be wrong because Paul says that whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Right? He's not saying that Peter knew everything that Christ sent him to do. Neither is he saying that Peter and I have the same ministry from the Lord. In Galatians 2, Peter had a ministry of the circumcision. Paul had a ministry of the uncircumcision. But what, what fell under agreement was that Christ rose from the dead. The Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 were denying Christ rising from the dead, denying resurrection. And so just as this morning, when I made the point that Jesus being God, never ceasing to be God, is a doctrine that the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Methodists believe for 2,000 years, you know, as long as they've been around. Right? It's the same thing that Paul says. Look, resurrection? Peter preaches that. I preach that. There's no new mystery about that. Christ rose from the dead, is his point. So these are things they have in common. So at the outset, we need to understand what happened to Peter's ministry, what happened to the little flock. Well, first of all, they weren't cast out to the trash bin of history because they believed Jesus was the Christ and they believed he rose from the dead. The only companions they would have had in the first century are the other believers in Christ. Okay? What do you think they're doing? They're separating from Paul's groups because, you know, well, we're Peter's group. You're Paul. Stay over there. Let's not talk to each other. Even though we both believe Jesus is the Christ. No, they were coming together. In fact, that was why Paul had to deal with some of the issues of the Jews and Gentiles mixing together. Okay? But we'll get to some of that more. What happened to Peter himself? Did Peter do that? Galatians 2, Peter went out to Paul's crowd. Remember that? Galatians 2, where Peter went out to Galatia, and Paul says, I had to rebuke him. I, ha I had to rebuke Peter, the Peter, the high apostle. I had to rebuke him. Why? Because when Peter came out to Galatia, this was after Paul and Peter had an agreement that we've got different ministries here. I go to the uncircumcision. You go to the circumcision. You go to Jerusalem. And so if you're coming out here to these Gentiles and you're separating from them, you're contrary to what Christ sent me to do. And Paul rebuked Peter to his face. Right? So see, Paul and Peter, they were sent to do different things. But they both believed Jesus was the Christ. They both believed he resurrected. And Peter probably wanted to go out to Galatia just to see there were other people believing in Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing to see people believe what you do. It's encouraging. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12. Paul's rebuke to the Corinthians was that they were divisive based on who they are uh, of. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12, This I say that every one of you says, 
I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. There were divisions in Corinth based on people apparently who said, I was baptized by Peter. I was baptized by Paul. And they were having these divisions as if who was of the better sect? Who was the better group? Who was the better teacher? Right? And Paul says, that's ridiculous. That's not what it's about. It's not about the teacher. It's not about who baptized you. Paul says in, in, in verse 14, I thank God I baptized none of you but these two guys. Right? And so he's thanking God he didn't baptize them? Yeah, because it's not about that, you see. It's not about the baptisms. It's not about uh, the teacher. You say, well, it's not about the teacher, Justin. Why do you say we follow Paul? Well, because after chapter 1, Paul says it twice to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, chapter 11. Follow me as I follow Christ. So what is Paul saying here? If he, Paul says, follow me as the pattern, what's he saying here? He's saying there were people who were dividing from what was true based on the person who they learned about Christ from. Well, I knew Christ in his earthly ministry. I saw him walk on the earth. Paul says, we don't know Christ after the flesh anymore. 2 Corinthians 5. When people said that Peter baptized me. Peter was the apostle at Pentecost who stood up and spoke. Saved thousands with the kingdom gospel. And Paul says, look, Peter preached resurrection, but I begotten you in the gospel. Okay. He says, I'm the one who's begun the dispensation of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay. He says in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Silly questions, right? Is Christ divided? No, Christ isn't divided. My point here being, if Peter taught Christ, Paul taught Christ, guess who's in Christ? Both of them. Right? Didn't Paul say there were those in Christ before me? Yeah. Being in Christ does not mean you were given the mystery to preach and you're part of the new creature. It means you're in Christ. Paul, uh, God's goal, the mystery of his will in Ephesians 1 verse 10 is that all things be brought together in Christ, the heavenly and the earthly. So that Peter taught Christ and Paul taught Christ, they're both in Christ, folks. Christ is not divided. And so in the first century in Corinth, when you got people who were, uh, who were taught the gospel, taught Jesus Christ and taught his death and resurrection from Peter, you don't kick them out. You say, you're in Christ. Come on in. God's doing something else now. You see. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13, Paul was not crucified for you. What's his point? I'm not the Savior, Paul says. Who's the Savior? Jesus Christ. Paul's not the Christ. And so these people who are dividing based on their teacher, this is a problem. Because the rule, as I wrote about in my email yesterday, the rule for us to follow is Jesus Christ. Christ crucified. Right? Now who, who, is, the, who is the apostle that explains that the clearest? The Apostle Paul. He preaches Christ in him alone. Peter preached Christ too. He just preached Christ as the king of the kingdom. But it's Christ is the issue. right? So Paul's making the point. It's not about the teacher. It's not about the baptism. It's about Jesus Christ. And by the way, what Jesus Christ is doing today. And so if what Christ is doing changes, you need to follow Jesus Christ in the change. Okay? Look at chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 5. One says, I'm of Paul. Another, I'm of Apollos. When you elevate Paul above Christ, you've got a problem. Okay? We follow Paul in Philippians 3, verse 17, as he instructs, because he says in Philippians 3, there's nothing more excellent than the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's how we follow Paul. We follow Paul because Paul says in Romans 16, it was given to me to preach the, Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So he preaches Jesus Christ. That's how we follow Paul. 1 Corinthians 3, in verse... Uh, Five. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So Apollos, remember, was preaching John the Baptist's message. And then there were people in Corinth, after Apollos was corrected by Priscilla and Aquila, who believed Jesus Christ and his salvation now. Okay. And Paul says, look, we're just ministers. I'm a minister. Peter's a minister. Apollos is a minister. Verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but who gives the increase? God. Right? The question is what happened to Peter's ministry is not what happened to Peter. It's what did God change? What did God do? Okay, what is God doing? Because if God doesn't want to operate through Peter anymore, it doesn't happen. If God doesn't want to operate through Paul anymore, it doesn't happen. God is the one that makes the change. So when we talk about the transition or talk about the events in the book of Acts and what happened there, we're asking the question, what, what is God doing? You see, 
This is not an evolution of the early church where at first it was Peter and then Peter and Paul got together in a church council and they started sharing doctrine. God revealed information and sent Paul with a specific ministry. Okay, the Holy Ghost filled Paul to the extent that he was doing the same miracles Peter was. And the book of Acts shows that, the Acts of the Apostles, that God changed his ministry from Peter's group to Paul. If anything, the book of Acts teaches is the fall of Israel and, and the change from God being preached to Israel to being preached to the world. Okay, that's what the book of Acts is about. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul, Paul says God gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 11. So we're talking about Peter. What happened to Peter's ministry? What happened to the little flock? I mean, did they just keep going and keep preaching? So even today there's a little flock church somewhere that we ought to deal with? Well, no. God's not doing that anymore. Okay, and 1 Corinthians 4. You know, the people who were part of the little flock, this may be a shock, maybe you haven't thought about it. The people who were part of the little flock were all members of the flock before Paul got saved, before Paul did his ministry. That's how they became members of the little flock. It was not since Paul starts preaching this gospel to the world that the little flock is now an option. You know, oh, well, okay, you got a choice. You can either believe my gospel or this little flock thing. You choose. That's not how it went, okay? People in Little Flock, they were part of the Little Flock before Paul even got saved, a little before the mystery was revealed. And so when Paul comes on the scene, when God reveals to Paul the message and the ministry he sent to him to do, this was later, okay? That's the progress. We'll get to there in a moment. First Corinthians 4, verse 11. Look what Paul says. Um, did I say 11? I need verse 6, I think, is what I want. Verse 6. Paul's dealing with the Apollo issue, the division based on the teacher, and says, look, we're ministers. And ministry, ministers, in verse 1, should be faithful to the mysteries of God, to the message that he gave them to preach. So it's about the message and about what God's doing. And so in verse 6, Paul says, These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. What happened to Peter's group? It, doesn't verse 6 define Roman Catholicism who takes Peter and elevates him to a position that the scripture does not give him based on early church tradition? I think that's what, exactly what it's saying there. It says that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is what? Written. Written. Well, I heard that P Peter did this. I heard that Peter was the first bishop in Rome. Show me chapter and verse. It's not written anywhere in the Bible. Okay. Where is it written about them? What we know is that it is written about Paul that he is the apostle of the Gentiles from 11 verse 13. It is written about Paul, he's the dispenser of God's grace. It's written about Peter, that he was one of the 12 apostles sent to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what's written about them, you see. So we can make judgments. It's not about the men. The men don't matter. It's the message that God's communicating through these men, and it's written what these messages are and what God's doing. That's what's important. What happened to Peter's ministry? Well, the truth is, we don't read anything about what was written about Peter's ministry past Acts 15. He doesn't even show up anymore which ought to communicate something. What was God doing after Acts 15? Not Peter, <laughs> apparently, or else he would have wrote something about it, right? Peter himself writes in 2 Peter to consider what Paul has to say about what God is doing now, because apparently the kingdom's not coming presently, is what Peter said. We'll get to that in a little bit. So all this is to say, make the point that Peter and Paul had different ministries, different messages, but they had things in common about Jesus Christ and the believing his resurrection, okay? They were both on board with believing Jesus Christ came to fulfill all things and to bring salvation to the world. Peter was given the task to preach it through Israel, which eventually stopped, and Paul was given the task to preach it without Israel, which is still going on today. Okay, both of them preached Jesus Christ, both of them preached resurrection. I alluded to in a moment there the, another difference in Peter and Paul's ministry and how they were not uh, intruding on each other's territory and giving people the option. Do you want... Salvation item A or salvation item B, you know, that's not what was going on. Because, first of all, God set it up that way. You read how Peter and Paul were sent to minister. Jesus Christ told Peter to stay in Jerusalem, didn't he? Until you'd be filled with the Holy Ghost. And where did the Holy Ghost fill them? In Jerusalem, at Pentecost. And where did they minister? In Jerusalem. 
They didn't leave. Now, Peter wasn't from Jerusalem, but he ministered in Jerusalem because Jesus Christ told him to minister there. Where did Paul, did Paul minister Jerusalem? Did Christ send Paul to Jerusalem? Not a day in his life. Christ never, in fact, Christ is found in the book of Acts telling Paul to get out of Jerusalem, right? You never see Christ tell that to Peter. So the point here I'm trying to make is that Paul and Peter ministered in different locations at different times, and that's so important. It's not as if God sent an angel from heaven and said, now follow Paul. <laughs> it wasn't that. He sent Peter to preach to the circumcision, the kingdom gospel, through which the world will be blessed, through Israel and Israel's capital city, where the temple's at, in Jerusalem. So he starts there. In Acts 9, after Israel rejects Peter's message, he saves the, the persecutor of this group, okay, and saves him by his grace and sends him to the Gentiles to preach. The Gentiles had not been given any message prior to Paul. You see, it was not as if Paul was going around now and correcting everybody. Oh, you'd heard Peter teach this, now I'm preaching something different. Now, what confuses people, I think, is because we do that all the time. We, today in 2015, right? We talk about churches who preach a kingdom gospel and how they're wrong to do so. And we correct them with the mid right division, how Paul's message instructions are. Okay? That's not what Paul was doing in the first century. Okay? Paul was not battling, you know, Peter's group in the sense that he was not saying, you guys are wrong, you need to change to what I'm doing. Paul actually <laughs> evangelized people. He actually went to people who didn't know the gospel, presented the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, and they were saved. Now, that's a strange thing, I know, when churches just steal from each other now, but that's what Paul did. He saved people with this preaching of the message. And so he communicated to them. Now, of course, we'll see a little bit later, there were people who were part of Peter's group that obviously bumped into some of Paul. Paul's people, and for a reason. But just right now, recognize that Peter and Paul ministered in different locations. What happened to Peter's group? They stayed in Jerusalem. They never made it out of Jerusalem. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. They were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. They were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 4. They were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, when they stoned Stephen after his chapter-long message, preaching Jesus as the Messiah and the kingdom come to Israel, the Jewish leaders stoned Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost, and Saul was there consenting unto his death. This is in verse 1. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Okay, those last four words there are important, which was at Jerusalem, because there was no other church anywhere else. The church was at Jerusalem, and that's going to be held in contrast in the book of Acts to the churches everywhere else. But this church in Jerusalem was where the Holy Ghost started the ministry of the kingdom gospel from Acts 1 through 8. And they were all scattered, it says. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Now we've got a change going on. So they were in Jerusalem preaching a message until chapter 8. And then when there was great persecution led by Saul, what happened? They scattered out from Jerusalem. Except the apostles. What happened to Peter's ministry? Peter didn't leave Jerusalem, folks. Now, by that I don't mean he didn't leave the, the town limits to get some groceries. I don't know. It, it's, he, his ministry did not leave Jerusalem. Okay? He, he stayed in Jerusalem, and the reason why was not because he was so bold and courageous necessarily, even though he was filled with the Holy Ghost, because Christ instructed him to do that. You get Jerusalem saved, then you get Judea saved, the southern two tribes, then you get Samaria saved, the other ten tribes, and then Israel preaches to all the nations the gospel of the kingdom, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That was their commission. In Acts chapter 8, these believers were scattered. The church was in disarray. Okay? By the way, where did they scatter? The regions of Judea and Samaria. They're still in Israel, not in Jerusalem. Where did Paul go in his ministry? Ephesus, Rome, Philippi. He went to Greece. He went to Asia. These are outside of Israel. This is where you need a map, right? Jesus didn't spend a day in his life outside the land of Israel. And he told the apostles to stay in Jerusalem preaching their kingdom message. And when they were scattered, they were scattered out of the city, but in the nation, because they're Jews, by the way. You know, they got to stay. Hopefully this kingdom message thing works out. <laughs> right? But Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, heading out of Israel. And then when he was heading out, Christ sent him even further. Out. Paul's ministry was in a different place. Okay? There was not that initial conflict initially. That we'll see it eventually happen, but it wasn't initially. Okay, Peter taught new covenant blessing to the nation of Israel. 
He was told to stay in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1. In Acts 3.19, he's preaching to the people that God promised a kingdom to. In Acts 3.19, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Okay, the times of refreshing have to do with Israel. Have to do with Jerusalem. Okay, the times of refreshing have to do with their deliverance. Paul taught the mystery of Christ to a new creature. Acts 9.15, Jesus says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles and to kings and the children of Israel. He's sending them out. Okay. In Galatians 1.16, Paul says that what he received was of Christ. And he says, I did not go to Jerusalem. So what I'm saying here that Paul didn't go to Jerusalem, it, this is what the Bible says. That Paul says, when people are claiming that he's actually a student of Peter. Because, you know, these, these battles are going on. Well, we follow Peter. We follow Paul. And Paul says, look, I was not a student of Peter. Peter didn't teach me this message. I don't even teach the message that Peter teaches. This is in Galatians chapter 1. He says, when God, it pleased God to separate me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. Paul was commissioned to do a ministry, you know, apart from Jerusalem and Peter. Okay? And so it's important to recognize that. Romans 15, verse 20, back up a few pages. Paul says he was traveling around the world preaching his message that Christ has sent him to do. Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises of God to, to the fathers. Romans 15, verse 8, which I just butchered the verse. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus Christ was sent to the circumcision to preach their promises. Look at verse 9. That the Gentiles might glorify God. What? You know, we often quote Romans 15, verse 8, Christ was sent to the circumcision. What about verse 9? What's he saying there? Paul's quoting prophecy in verse 9. He says, Jesus Christ came to Israel to minister the promises so that when Israel was saved and preached the kingdom and the kingdom came, the Gentiles would glorify God. They'd be blessed through Israel. Jesus' message was salvation through his promised people. Romans 15 verse... Uh, I just lost my, my place here. Verse 16 is what I want. Verse 15 and 16. Paul says, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. Now that's in direct contrast to Jesus Christ ministering to the circumcision. Is Paul ministering to Gentiles? They're ministering to different people, in different places, and at a different time. Okay? But down in verse 20, Paul makes the case that he, through mighty signs and wonders, preached the power of the Spirit of God and around, uh, from Jerusalem, around about Illyricum, and he's fully preached the gospel of Christ. Verse 20, so have, I preached, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. You see verse 20? Paul says, I did not preach where Christ was named. Well, where was Christ named? Where was the only place in the world that Christ was named already? Jerusalem. Israel. The city where Peter was at preaching Jesus Christ's name. Right? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And thousands believed. And Paul says, I did not preach where Christ was named. Why wouldn't he? Because Christ did not send me there. You see, God is orchestrating this change. Israel has rejected Peter's ministry and rejected Stephen's message and stoned him with, the, uh, with stones, and then he sends Paul to Gentiles, not to Jerusalem. Why not to Jerusalem? Don't they deserve a second chance? Yeah, they got it. And they rejected it. You see, Christ sent Paul to the Gentiles. Okay? And so Paul says, I'm not preaching where he was named already. Paul's not trying to battle Peter. Okay? Look at Galatians chapter 2. We were there once before. But notice it again, how that eventually, even if you separate the ministries, as Christ did, as God did, Paul went to the Gentiles, Peter stayed in Jerusalem. He was going to stay there until the kingdom gospel worked, and we already saw that it's failing. They rejected it. In Galatians 2, Paul mentions that there's some contention. Because, you know, you start preaching a different message, and hopefully the idea is that as you understand the Bible rightly divided, and you start being conversant with people in your circles, that doctrines start bumping into each other, 
and I hope they talk about these doctrines in the Baptist churches and the Presbyterian churches and the Methodist churches and the, the non-denominational churches. I hope they talk about these issues because they hear them from people who go to their church, who hear them from you. I hope that happens. I hope there's a conversation going on about what the clear gospel is because that would be great. That'd be good ministry. But this is what happened in, Galatia, in, in, in the book of Acts where Paul's getting people saved among the Gentiles and the spirit out there is giving them gifts and they're doing powers and miracles and wonders and signs. And there are people in Peter's group who start to hear about this. And they're going, there's these Gentiles who say they believe in Jesus Christ. And they say they're saved. And, and not just saying it, they have the powers that we had. We, they're doing miracles, speaking in tongues. They're healing people. And so they start preaching to these Gentiles, look, look, if you're going to do that, you need to be circumcised. Why? Now, Acts 15 verse 1 says they are doing that because they ha can't be saved without circumcision. Well, who on earth would even think that if your message was, by grace you are saved through faith, not of works? If that was the message, why would you even think circumcision is what saves you? Okay. Answer, because the message that Peter was sent to preach was the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the kingdom, that the world, Gentiles, will be blessed through Israel. You Gentiles claim a blessing, you need to be water baptized, you need to be circumcised, you need to follow the law. Right? They're trying to do their kingdom ministry. And Paul says, red flag, yellow flag, whatever color it is. It's on a flag. Right? He says, you can't be teaching that to my people. And he goes, in Acts 15, verse 2, he takes Titus and some of these Gentiles back to Jerusalem. Okay? And he starts debating with them. and says, look, you can't teach that out here. Christ sent me to preach the gospel of the grace of God. Okay? Paul's not going to Jerusalem to communicate to them his message, and Peter get on board, okay, let's preach the same message, and everybody preaches the mystery and the gospel. That's not it. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Peter was in Jerusalem. There were people in Peter's ministry who were, because they were scattered, they started bumping into Paul's group, and they started making a problem. In fact, Paul calls them in Galatians 2, false brethren, in verse 4. What happened to Peter's group? Well, maybe not all of them were even part of Peter's group. <laughs> maybe they were false brethren. James talks about that. 1 John talks about that. Galatians 2 verse 4 says, Because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in to privily spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us to bondage. I gave no place, he says in verse 5, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you Galatians. Paul went and disputed with them in Acts 15. Argued with them, defending what Christ had given him to preach. What happened to Peter's group? They lost that argument, folks. They lost the argument. They did not come out of Acts 15 in that Jerusalem council, as the historians call it, and the guys in Jerusalem going, we won. Circumcision is part of the gospel. No. The end of that council was Paul was right. Isn't that the conclusion? Paul was right. Apparently, you can be saved without circumcision and without speaking in tongues and without the works of the law. That was their conclusion. Where did they learn such a thing? It wasn't from Jesus in his earthly ministry who said, I came to fulfill the law and taught his disciples to communicate the law in Matthew 28 and Matthew 23. It was from the message Christ sent Paul to preach. What happened to Peter's group? They lost Jerusalem Council. In fact, in Acts 15 is the last time you hear Peter speak. Okay? Look at Acts 15. Let's we'll, we'll turn there. The last time that Peter speaks in the book of Acts is Acts 15. When at the Jerusalem Council, and Paul's making the case that salvation go to Gentiles without you Israelites, without you Jerusalem people, without the circumcision, Paul says, or Peter says, he's right. Acts 15 in, um, I lost my place again. Is it 7? No, that's not right at all. Am I the wrong chapter? I, mean, I am the wrong chapter. Acts 15, verse uh, 11. Thank you. Peter stands up and says in verse 8 that God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness. Peter's argumentation is not theological necessarily. It's not a scriptural batter. Well, Peter throws a prophecy. Paul throws a prophecy. Peter says, God witnessed this to me. Remember in Acts 10, God told Peter these things. And he says, he gave him the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, not by works, not by circumcision. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Peter understands that what the law taught is that Israel couldn't do it, and they needed a savior. Peter understood that. 
Okay, in verse 11 then, he says, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, who's the we? People in Jerusalem, shall be saved even as they. Peter says, Paul's right. The grace he's preaching is correct. And I was preaching a kingdom come and salvation through Israel. That's why I've been saying in Jerusalem. But if God sent him out there to preach salvation to those guys, so be it. Okay, because we're going to be saved just as they are. We're not saved by our works, Peter says. Circumcision doesn't save us either. God told us to be circumcised. God told us to keep the law. That's what we're doing in Jerusalem. But that's not what saves us from our sins. Peter knew that. And so he says, we believe that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, shall, we shall be saved even as they. And so then they gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. And Paul was now given the right hand of fellowship. Okay, what happened to Peter's group? They stopped their commission. The great commission that Jesus Christ gave to Peter was that you're going to go to all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, commanding them all things that I taught you. Right? Teach them all things I commanded you. Matthew 28. Okay. Mark 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Luke 24. You know, stay in Jerusalem. Peter stayed in Jerusalem. He kept doing the commandments. He hadn't got to the nations yet because his own nation hadn't believed yet. <laughs> and when Paul came and said, hey, God sent me to preach something out there. Peter says, if God said it, I can't be against it. And he says, you do that. And in Galatians 2 verse 9, he gave the right hands of fellowship to Paul and Barnabas, that Peter would go to the circumcision and Paul would go to the heathen. Peter says, I'm not going to the nations now. That is huge, folks, huge. Because the, the commission that every church follows in Matthew 28 is to go to all nations. That was given to Peter and the kingdom group. And Peter said in Acts 15, in Galatians chapter 2, I'm not going to the nations anymore. It's huge. Whoever you make the circumcision, he says, I'm not going to the nations anymore. Okay. What happened to Peter's group? They stopped their evangelism program. Right? They, they were not going to the nations. Jerusalem never did get saved. Okay? Jerusalem never did get totally on board, and they haven't still. But if they had, what they would have done is followed Paul, but they haven't, okay? They haven't. Let's move on here. Let's, um, Acts 7. Acts chapter 7 in verse uh, 51. It was agreed by Peter and Paul that Paul would go to the heathen, the uncircumcised, and Peter would go to the circumcised. Now, I've got to make a small point. We'll move on because this can take another lesson to go through. But who are the uncircumcised? By the time Peter and Paul meet in Acts 15, who are the uncircumcised people? Number one, Gentiles are uncircumcised in the flesh. Who else? Acts 7, verse 51, Stephen said six chapters earlier, to unbelieving Israel, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Unbelieving Israel was also considered uncircumcised. They were fallen, by the way. Paul said they're fallen. If they're fallen, fallen from what? Fallen from a spiritual standing to the standing of uncircumcised people. Paul was agreed by Peter to go to the heathen, to go to those who need to hear salvation, not to those people who already had it in Jerusalem. We already had the gospel of the kingdom, right? So Paul went, and where did he go? Everywhere he went in the book of Acts, he started with the synagogue. People say, if Paul went to the Gentiles, why did he go to the synagogue? Because people in the synagogue didn't believe Jesus was the Christ. They weren't saved. They were unbelieving. They were uncircumcised in their hearts. And Paul went to preach the gospel, and the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, is why they rejected Paul. It's because he was preaching free grace to all men. They go, oh, we can't accept that. Jesus is the Christ, maybe, but that he's saving all men without us? Nah, it's too much. And they, they rejected his message as well. The story of the book of Acts is the rejection of, Israel, of Christ by Israel. That's what the book of Acts is about. It's the Acts of the Apostles that by the power of the Holy Spirit in all of the Apostles, whether it be uh, the Twelve Apostles or the One Apostle Paul, the early church, to witnessing to Israel, they rejected that testimony. That's what the book of Acts is about. The book of Acts is not the beginning of the church, and it's not the, how the early church history began. You, know, you ever wonder why it stopped Acts 28? You're taught in, in seminary, you're taught in, in history books that the book of Acts is like a history book. It's the beginning of the early church. Then why did it stop in Acts 28? Shouldn't there have been an Acts 2? 
You know, Acts of the Apostles 2, I mean, at least continued until after Paul and Peter died. I mean, what was going on there? You know, Acts 29 probably said something about Peter establishing the Roman Catholic Church, right? You know, no. <laughs> Why was Acts written? It was written for the fall of Israel. The last thing that happens in Acts is Israel is done. Paul says, I'm not going to Jews any longer. Salvation is sent to Gentiles, and they will hear it. It's about salvation going from Israel to Gentiles, because Israel rejected it. Acts shows Israel in decline. By the way, when I say Acts shows Israel in decline, what do I mean? Israel, who was given to be a nation above the nations, who was promised a kingdom come, was in decline. They had fallen, right? What was Peter's message? The kingdom come to Israel. If Acts is the fall of Israel, what happens to Peter's ministry? It fell too. It's done, right? You're selling a product nobody wants. You're done, you see? That's what the book of Acts does. Well, I mean, that's kind of lonely for a preacher. What, did you pick up another message? No. Christ sent him to preach the kingdom to Israel. He preached the kingdom. He offered the kingdom. He said the end times are coming. You better believe this and repent or else, you know, Christ is going to come back. You ain't going to be happy. And Israel rejected it. So much they rejected him. They stoned his, his disciples, you know, Stephen there. And even when Paul went to the synagogues, not in Jerusalem, Paul went to synagogues everywhere else. Right? They rejected him as well. Jews didn't, Israel did not want anything to do with Jesus Christ. That's what Acts is about. Okay. Can Jews be saved? Yes, they can. Through Paul's gospel, though. And through the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. But Peter's ministry stopped. Okay. If we were to draw a chart of the book of Acts. So you've got Acts 1, 28. Uh, middle chapter is what, 14, 7, 21? What's Acts about? Well, we got Acts chapter 1, where Jesus meets with the 12 apostles for 40 days, preaching the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost poured out on Peter, pre preaches a message to Jerusalem at Pentecost. Acts chapter 3, Peter preaches a sermon, again, outside the temple. Acts chapter 4, he gets imprisoned, but gets delivered from prison, and preaches the kingdom to Israel. Acts chapter 5, again, he's preaching the kingdom message. Acts chapter 6, he's presenting this message to other people who are getting part of his group. Acts 7, Stephen, one of those people, preaches a sermon to Israel, and they kill him. And so, so far we've got seven chapters of Peter. Seven chapters of kingdom. Seven chapters of these guys preaching a message to Israel. What happens in Acts chapter 8? Okay, they get scattered out of Jerusalem. What happens in Acts chapter 9? Saul gets saved on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 10. Oh, there's Peter again. Oh, great. Let's put him on there. We got Peter in Acts chapter 10. Oh, not just chapter, chapter 10, but chapter 11. Acts 10, Peter goes to Cornelius. Acts 11, he goes back to Jerusalem and explains why God told him to go to Cornelius. Acts chapter 12, you have James in prison and killed. Peter in prison and delivered by the angel. Acts 12, Jerusalem goes to King Herod and King Herod dies. Acts 8, or Acts 9, or not 9, excuse me, 10. 10 verse 12 is Peter again. What happens Acts 13? Switch to Paul. Paul is sent by the Holy Ghost out to the Gentile nations to preach his message. First place he goes, he finds the Jew. It's unbelieving. He blinds him. Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas go preaching to among the Gentiles. They think they're gods. He tells them otherwise. Okay. Acts 15, now there's Peter again. By this time in Paul's ministry, he's hearing from some in Jerusalem that the Gentiles need to be circumcised. Paul doesn't like it. He goes to Jerusalem to correct those people in Jerusalem about the message he has. And Peter stands up and says, Paul's right. Okay. Salvation isn't a circumcision. 16, Paul ministers. 17, Paul ministers. 18, Paul ministers. Act 19, Paul ministers to Jews who don't believe with the Holy Spirit in him. We'll put a half block there. Because these were Jews who believed John the Baptist's message. But they heard Jesus from who? Paul. Right? Acts 20, Paul's ministering. Acts 21, he gets the hunch to go to Jerusalem. Why? God didn't tell him to. In fact, there was a prophet that told Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, you're going to be chained there. Well, he told him he'd be chained. He didn't tell him not to. They said, you're going to be imprisoned. And Paul says, I'm ready. I'm ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul went to Jerusalem in Acts 21. And we taught Paul's trial, which is the last seven chapters of the book of Acts, between Paul and Israel. The trial, the court case that lasted seven chapters, the question on the table was, was Jesus the Christ and did he raise from the dead? Because if he was, then Paul should be acquitted. He's not guilty of heresy. But if he wasn't, then Paul's teaching heresy. That was the trial. And for seven chapters, for many years, Paul has a trial. It begins in Jerusalem, where they arrest him. Okay. And then it goes out to 
uh, Caesarea. And then it goes out to Rome. And by the time the trial ends, Paul says, you Jews, Israel, you've rejected this, the mess of Jesus Christ. Okay. But again, the question we're asking is not necessarily what happened all throughout the book of Acts. It's what happened to Peter's ministry. And what do we see? It began up here. It's not over here. <laughs> it began we get a little bit, a little bit. What happened to Paul? He gets saved here, and we hear more and more and more. And there's a pattern here. What happened to Peter's ministry? It stopped. Peter stopped. The last thing we hear from him is Acts 15. What happened to Paul's ministry? The Holy Ghost empowered him, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached. He preached to Israel, and they rejected him too. So he said, I'm done with you, and he preached to Gentiles. And every epistle he writes is to Gentiles. It's to the world. It's the gospel of the grace of God. Okay. Acts shows the decline of Israel. Acts also records the expansion of Paul's ministry. There's a principle here. Look at John chapter 3, verse 30. We've dealt with this before, this doctrine or this teaching of transition in the Bible. And in some places, you go centuries without anything changing from what God is doing. In the Old Testament, you see that. There's centuries where you're, you're living out of the law, you know. But it, suddenly, in Matthew, look in John, things start happening rapidly. And John the Baptist starts preaching the kingdom. So we're back beyond Acts over here in the book of John. John the Baptist preaches this kingdom come. And people start to believe him. Okay? He preaches a Messiah come after him. When the Messiah does come and starts preaching his own message of the kingdom, people start following the Messiah. And John's disciples get a little jealous. And they say, John, they are following that guy. And John says, yeah, that's the Messiah. And the principle he has is John 3, verse 30, is that he, Christ, must increase, but I must decrease. Very simple statement. I think profound, though, because what John is saying is, look, my ministry doesn't matter. It's about preaching Christ, the Messiah, and he's Christ, the Messiah. He came after me, as Malachi 3 said, and so they should follow him, right? I'm going to decrease. John the Baptist gets his head cut off. <laughs> that puts an end to his ministry pretty quick, right? Peter didn't get his head cut off. But what happens in the book of Acts? Peter's given a message. He's at Pentecost. He stands up. He's preaching. He's building the church in, 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 the Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. He's in Acts 10, Acts 11, Acts 12, right? And what happens? Well, God changes what he's doing. God appears to Paul right here. God calls Paul out right here in Acts 13. God starts working miracles through Paul. God changes what he's doing. Christ sent Paul with the message. And Peter, when he hears this message from Paul, says, Christ sent you with a message, I must decrease, you, as Christ sent you, need to increase. That's why he told him, go to the nations. You go to the heathen. That's a pretty big piece of ground to give up, you know? The world. <laughs> but Peter said, you go to the heathen. Peter recognizes. Christ sent Paul. Paul after him, by the way. Peter was saved first, or Peter was, Peter knew Christ for Paul. But Peter recognized it's about Christ. And if Christ wants to change what he's doing, if the Holy Ghost changed what he's doing, then I'm with it. Okay? Peter preached Israel's kingdom come and Israel's restoration of the kingdom. And we've already covered the, the Acts here that by the end of the book, Acts 28, Paul says the kingdom's not coming anymore. If there's one thing we learn in Acts 28, it's that they've rejected their kingdom. Okay? If they've rejected their kingdom, they've rejected Peter's kingdom message. Right? Okay, it's not coming. Now, salvation continues. And so from Acts 28 on, we hear about salvation. But how does this salvation come? Does it come through a kingdom, through Israel, through Peter? No. It would come through whom Christ sent to preach it. The cross. Grace. Okay. In Acts 12, James, one of the twelve apostles, dies. This is a problem for your message when your messengers are dying. Okay. The twelve apostles that were filled with the Holy Ghost... They were promised the kingdom come. Shouldn't he have raised from the dead or something? Couldn't Peter raise him from the dead? But he died and he stayed dead. What happened? Peter was thrown in prison. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, the verse is on the top of your outline. Peter, when he writes his final epistle, he's anticipating death. Peter is not saying, you know, this kingdom's going to come any day now because I'm getting old. You know, Christ promised. Right? He believed Christ in what he said. But you know, Christ also told Paul or Peter he was going to die. Remember that in John 21? And then Peter says, what about John? What about that guy? Jesus says, no, you don't, need to, don't worry about that guy. He says, you're going to die for me. 
Peter didn't die here. He didn't die here. He didn't die here. But in 2 Peter 1, verse 14, Peter says, Knowing shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. What happened to Peter's ministry? He died. Peter's little flock died. Okay? They did not continue to go into the kingdom. The kingdom did not come. Okay? Israel rejected the kingdom. And when they rejected the kingdom, which was the only way known to that point of how anyone can be saved, Christ revealed salvation clearly to all men through the preaching of the cross of the Apostle Paul. See, so salvation never stopped. It was how it came that stopped. The message that was preached to bring it changed from Peter to Paul. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Read 2 Peter. Read what Peter is saying in 2 Peter, because 2 Peter is written after Paul was saved. And um, he mentions Paul in 2 Peter 3. He mentions Paul to explain what's happening now, because Peter was preaching last days, folks. Peter was preaching like some foolishly charismatics preach today about last days happening. I read the other day that there's some teacher out there now regurgitating some old teaching, which was that uh, we've passed the fifth seal in Revelation. It happened. You just didn't see it. But uh, the fifth seal is actually Saddam Hussein over there when he burnt the oil fields and the smoke. Remember in the 1990s? Some of you weren't even born in the 1990s. It, it, you know, over there in the, the Persian Gulf where he burnt the oil fields and there's black smoke in the air. And uh, then there were the helicopters that uh, America sent over you know, to fight this Persian Gulf War. It's so on Revelation 9, it talks about this fifth seal where the, uh, the pit of hell is opened up and these locusts come out and uh, the sky is dark for five months. Well, guess how long he burnt those oil fields over there? Five months. And uh, guess who, who, who the angel of the pit was called in Revelation 9? Abaddon, Abaddon, Apollyon. You've read Left Behind series? Good. Apollyon translates in the Persian to Saddam, destroyer. It's black and white, folks. Revelation 9, the fifth seal of Saddam Hussein, the Persian Gulf. Question. Wasn't that like 20 years ago? <laughs> but this is what they do. How did I get on this point? Second Peter chapter 1. <laughs> Second Peter. It's fun to talk about that stuff, isn't it? Distracts you from what's right. Second Peter writes this epistle, and it's decades after his preaching in Acts 2. He says the sun's going to turn dark, the moon's going to turn to blood. He's preaching prophetic signs. And it's decades after he preached that message. And the people who are following Peter go, hey, Pete, just checking up on you. Uh, we're not in the kingdom. Are you in the kingdom? How's it going? You know, and Peter's right in 2 Peter saying, let's look at verse 13. I don't want to paraphrase. I'd make a horrible Bible translator, apparently. Verse 12. Uh, well, nope, I went back in verse uh, 10. It says, Rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Peter says, don't give up, folks. You believe Jesus Christ. You believed he resurrected. You know who he is. He says, I did not bury tales. I saw him resurrected. And better than that, you have prophecy that proves he was the Christ. Second Peter 1 says. But he says, make your calling and election sure, for if you do those things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter's still preaching this kingdom to the people who were following him. The point is, he's, he's, he's continuing with the hope of the kingdom. By the way, do you preach that a kingdom will come? Do you believe, or let me say it that way, do you believe that a kingdom will come? Yeah, we do. Do we believe Peter was a liar, and that Christ was a liar, and that we preach grace now, kingdom's not coming? No, we preach a kingdom will come, but just not now, not yet. Because Christ has, is doing something else, dispensation of grace. And so that's what 2 Peter's all about. Peter says, you will be given an entrance to that kingdom. Why? Because these are the very people that Peter's writing to that were back here in Peter's ministry that were promised an entrance into the kingdom. What's Peter supposed to say? Well, since Christ sent Paul to preach, he's given your seat to somebody else. Christ promised me a throne in the kingdom. That's what Peter and James and John could have said. That's what the little flock was promised. So Peter doesn't backtrack and say, ah, you don't have those seats anymore. No, he says, you will be given an entrance to the kingdom. He says, don't deny the faith, don't deny Jesus Christ, right? But he does say, we're going to die. The kingdom's not coming is his point. The kingdom's not here. Verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. What present truth? The present truth that the kingdom is not here. Though you know the kingdom is not here, you also know Jesus is the Christ and he promised the kingdom will come. Even Paul preached the kingdom come. 
right, in the future. In verse 13, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must be put off this tabernacle. See, Peter still, Peter wasn't the guy who doubted what Christ told him to do. Okay? He walked on water when Christ told him to get out of the boat. Christ told him to do something, he did it. Okay? Christ told him to preach the kingdom, he did it. Christ told Paul to tell Peter, stop, he did it. <laughs> but Peter kept preaching what Christ sent him to preach to the people that he came to preach it to. I know you guys are looking for that kingdom, and I know it's not here, you know it's not here, but stay true to what Christ told us to do. That's what Peter says. Peter says, Paul wrote some things, it's hard to understand, because they weren't given to me, right? But what does Peter understand about what Paul said? That God is not ushering in the kingdom now. He's long-suffering so that all would come to salvation. That's what Peter knows. And Peter says, that makes sense. That makes sense. That Christ is not a liar. His kingdom will come. He's waiting to see more people saved. And that's what Paul's doing. I'm for that. That's what Peter says. Okay. What happened to the little flock? They died. They're 2,000 years removed from us, folks. They're gone. They're dead. That says nothing about what we ought to be doing and the message we ought to be preaching. Okay. They died, they were scattered, they diminished, their ministry fell apart. There were false teachers that Paul tried to correct as they scattered around and tried to influence Paul's churches. Some ministered Christ with Paul. Barnabas was part of Peter's group. God told Barnabas, oh, go help Paul out, which really helped a lot because there were Jews who denied that Paul was even an apostle. And Barnabas says, no, he is, I know. That gives a lot of credibility to Paul when a guy who was part of Peter's group says, oh, he's an apostle. That really helps. What about Mark? John Mark, Barnabas' nephew? At first, Paul didn't want him ministering with him because he gave up too frequently. He had problems with some of the, the doctrines. But eventually, Mark, he was with Paul at the end in Colossians chapter 4. He says, Marcus is with me. He's Barnabas' nephew, and he's great help in the ministry. So these little flock folks... When they learned that God's no longer bringing in this kingdom and that God's working through Paul's ministry, some of them would go, hey, I want to help out with what God's doing. Wouldn't you? <laughs> Wouldn't you? Right? Now, who you don't find tagging along with Paul is Peter. Because Christ told Peter to stay in Jerusalem. Right? But the other folks in Jerusalem scattered around because Christ didn't tell all those, just Peter and the twelve. He told, you guys stay there. You're the foundation of the kingdom. You are, literally, Revelation says, the city, you are the foundation stones. Right? But there are folks helping Paul out. What does that mean? They switched messages, they're no longer in the kingdom? No, they're, they're communicating what Christ is doing. They're preaching Christ to the Jews. They're preaching salvation by grace, as Peter also affirmed. Right? So, God changed what he was doing. God's people helped do that. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Where was Peter told to stay? Jerusalem. Now, Peter's probably dead by then, but Jerusalem 70 AD, the Romans come, they destroy the whole city. What cannot be preached anymore? The gospel of the kingdom. If the kingdom starts in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans, what's that do with the gospel of the kingdom? <laughs> I know Christ is raised, but your city's gone. You'll need a new city. Oh, Revelation says the city's going to come down from heaven. But their gospel is not being preached anymore. It's not good news when your city gets destroyed and your apostles die and your nation that you're supposed to be preaching to rejects it. Okay. Paul was sent to Gentiles. He went to one Gentile city. When they rejected, he went to another Gentile city. And he went to the whole world. That's what we're still doing today. Peter's ministry of Christ to Israel is replaced by Paul's ministry of Christ to the world. That's what happened to Peter's ministry. Okay. I hope that helps a little bit. Any, any comments, any questions about what happened. You notice there's no verse directly that mentions. And that's of course what Paul says, you know, if it were written about them, then that would really give attention to what God was doing through them. And the fact that we don't have the continuing of their ministry, and we do have Paul who completed God's word with his ministry, the grace of God, uh, should mean something, that God moved along in his, uh, in his progressive revelation. Any questions? Okay, let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word once again, that even when we come to it with questions such as these, we do find...
uh, answers as we see the transition that you made, that you performed between Peter and Paul uh, to preach yourself to the world according to the mystery. We thank you for that, without which we wouldn't be saved. And uh, we thank you also for your faithfulness to do what you promise, and that eventually Peter will be seen again in that kingdom, and your kingdom will come to the earth. And so as we're given the task to be your ambassadors before you do that work, that we would be faithful to the mysteries you've given us. Uh, thank you for the folks here this morning and their encouragement and their participation in doing your ministry. Amen. Thank you, folks.